But right, right now, more recently, in the last 10 or 15 years, there's been an incredible growth of literature in neuroscience, evolutionary psychology, genetics, cognitive science, that shows exactly how we are caused, fully caused creatures, how we develop, how we learn, become ourselves. Neuroscience can show in real time how we make decisions. There's a, there's a guy named um, Joshua Green in Princeton, a psychologist, who's uh, done MRI scans in real time of people actually solving moral dilemmas, where he says, to people, imagine there's a, a train track that splits. Your grandmother's on one side and you've got a stranger on another. You have control over which way the train goes, which way are you going to push it. And there are two parts of the brain that light up. One that's the quantitative side that weighs one person here and one person there. And then there's an emotional side that weighs your grandmother against your stranger. Guess which way you'll push the train? <coughs> to granny, no. <laughs> so. What, what, what you do, of course, is you manipulate the variables. You have put two strangers here and grandma here, three strangers. Now which way is the train going to go? Eventually it'll, it'll hit grandma because the quantitative side takes precedence over the, quali uh, the emotional side. But at any rate, the point is that this kind of decision making, this choice, this choosing that we all take so seriously and should take seriously, is something that the brain does physically, deterministically. It's a marvelous organ of choice. We are choice-making machines, as someone sort of cynically put it. Of course, we're organic. Don't forget that. And we're not about to be reproduced or, or manufactured anywhere soon. We're, we're still quite special, although the robots are coming. Now, I placed... Oh, actually, I just want to mention a couple of books. This is my favorite book on this topic by a guy named Owen Flanagan. He's a professor at Duke University. And in your handouts, if you have them, share if you don't. Um, the last page of the third page has a, a list of books, and this is at the top of the list. But I'll tell you what it is. It's called The Problem of the Soul. And it's all about the soul and free will and ethics and coming to terms with the, the naturalistic view of ourselves. This is the book I was starting to write when it came out, so it saved me the trouble. <laughs> so what can I say? It's, it's really here in this book, very well said. With, I, I would add to it, uh, in terms of its implications, but that's okay. Um, wonderful, wonderful book. And then Daniel Dennett at Tufts has written a book called Freedom Evolves, just out, what, a couple of years ago. I highly recommend that. Uh, Steven Pinker, an evolutionary psychologist, has written The Blank Slate, and he's got a whole chapter on the fear of determinism. And he takes dead aim at something called the ghost in the machine, which is another word for the soul. So. Well, I'm, and, and there are any number of philosophers now writing on free will who mostly agree and write to, the, to that effect that we don't have this kind of contracausal, what philosophers call libertarian free will. That's the philosophical term for this kind of free will. Libertarian or Cartesian. Cartesian coming from Descartes who, who posited that we have souls instead of, as well as bodies. So there's a lot of consensus coming up now scientific consensus that, yeah, guess what? We're fully physical creatures. We don't have this special kind of freedom. Now, this seems like a very tough sell. It's controversial because most people suppose we do have souls and that it's important to have this special kind of freedom. But to take science seriously about ourselves is to question this belief. So what possible good would it do to admit that we're fully natural creatures? Well, here are some big implications which I hope We'll quickly run over because I want to leave some time for questions. Um, and that's why I hope you'll respond to all this. I'm just laying something out. I hope you'll pick it apart, take your best shot at it. That's where a lot of learning on my, my part gets done. We have to frame naturalism positively. People want there to be something more. They want there to be a god up there. They want there to be a soul. We desire to live on after we die. So to deny all this means that we have to present this, our philosophy, very positively. So what's true if we don't have souls? What's true about ourselves if we're fully connected to the rest of the world? Well, if we are fully connected, then what does that mean about ourselves? It means we're at home here in the cosmos. We are card-carrying participants in the unfolding drama and unscripted drama that is the world that we're in right this moment. 
That's a marvelous fact. Naturalism says, yes, we are of a peace with nature. We don't have to go worrying about getting to heaven. The heaven we have is what we can make of it here, right here on earth. And what does this do? It re-enchants the physical world. Because when you see that the brain does all these remarkable things, the brain produces the experience you're having right now. The brain is what allows us to be such smart creatures. We don't need souls for any of this. It's the brain that creates art, that appreciates art and music, that loves, that takes things seriously, that asks questions. When you see that it's the physical world incarnate in yourself that's doing all this, this gives you a new respect and admiration for what the physical world can do. To, in fact, to say that the soul does it is kind of a cheat. It's to rob the physical world of its real majesty. So naturalism re-enchants the physical world and it means that the questions, the ultimate concerns that we have, our ultimate questions, then become addressed on the basis of science. We see that our connection is real, not intuited, not mythical. It's absolutely real and concrete. And this is the basis for a naturalistic, dare I say, spirituality. I know that's a naughty word for many people here. So I say it advisedly and I say it non-dualistically. But there's lots of precedent for it. Another wonderful book, which doesn't happen to be on the reading list that's there, called The Sacred, <coughs> Sacred Depths of Nature by Ursula Goodenough. She's a biologist out in St. Louis. She's one of the major proponents of the religious naturalism movement. I strongly recommend it. The sac recommend this, The Sacred Depths of Nature. It's one of several books that uh, are out there. Another guy named Loyal Rue. Strange name, R-U-E. First name, Loyal. Write that down. He's got a couple of very good books also. So connection is a big positive implication of naturalism. Another is compassion. Why? We, if we're not self-caused, then as I said earlier, we're not ultimately responsible. And you and you and you are not ultimately responsible for, for being perhaps the terrible person that you are. Seeing that, I can't blame you in the same way that I could before, thinking that you had the freely willed choice to be something other than you actually turned out to be. So seeing that we're fully caused, seeing that we're determined to be the way we are, as science shows us to be, means that we're much more likely not to stigmatize people, not to blame them in the same way, not to feel contempt in the same way, or morally superior, and I can't feel this prideful about myself and my accomplishments. As soon as I start getting up on a high horse, I'll realize, ah, guess what? I'm fully caused to be the way I am. So I can't take credit in the same way that I did before either. It works both ways. No ultimate credit, no ultimate blame. So this also helps us to see that there but for circumstances go I. Looking at Jeffrey Dahmer or any horrific contemptible individual, contemptible, again, I say advisedly here, with our, new, with our philosophy in place, the contempt starts to leach away once we understand the causal background of the people that we'd very much like not to be. And now, I warn you, this doesn't mean that we don't still have standards. We still find them reprehensible. Criminals are still kept in jail for very good reasons, but we don't feel the same moral superiority that we might otherwise feel. And similarly, we can forgive ourselves in a very important and real way when we understand that our behavior arises on its own out of the circumstances that we've been brought up in and that we're currently in right now. So we have connection, we have a kind of compassion and empathy that naturalism gives us. Third, control. Why control? Well, Understanding, as I said at the beginning, understanding causality is the key. 